How do you estimate GDP in a war zone? Well, since the invasion, the National Bank of Ukraine has been forced to improvise and use high frequency data. So what is it telling us and how reliable is it? Hello, Michna, welcome. Hi, nice to, nice to be here. Now, first of all, tell me, why is it important that at a time of such disruption to continue collecting GDP data in Ukraine? So there are two immediate uh, objectives. The first one is to understand the scale uh, uh, of damages. Uh, the second is to be able to understand to what degree economic activity will be able to support military action uh, going forward. The medium and longer term uh, importance of this is we need to understand which sectors, which areas are heavily damaged, which areas, which sectors are less damaged to, to be able to set up a proper redevelopment plan. Uh, this seems to me to have some parallels to what a lot of governments did during COVID-19, where they needed very rapid data because they needed to uh, to act quickly. What, what have we learned recently about the potentials and the drawbacks of this sort of high frequency data? Yeah, so I think this is um, the COVID showed indeed that there's a great potential to this data. Uh, but there are some uh, per potential pitfalls because we this is not data that's collected primarily with a, an economic question in mind. And without that, having this particular setting in mind, you know, we might be capturing certain aspects which are not necessarily connected uh, to, to an economic activity. And this is also what we observe. What we are actually measuring is human activity, broadly understood as such. And some of the earliest um, usage of uh, nightlight data was actually to measure uh, human activity and to understand its impact on the environment. So the early papers in the 80s were much more about this. They, they were not tar targeting economic activity. Uh, so there, there are very good applications and very good opportunities there. But we have to keep in mind that, um, you know, measuring global trips or Uber trips are not necessarily all about consumption and, and so on and so forth in the way that GDP definition understands it. Uh, clearly, different parts of the country have been affected in very, very different ways. Is it important to be able to collect regional, not just national data at the moment? Yes, absolutely. And for larger countries, this is absolutely essential. Um, in our case, this became uh, immediately obvious. So if you look at the nightlight state, Data, which is also uh, something that you see in rents, you will see that where uh, um, regions were heavily affected by fighting, uh, people left, there's no markets, we can't talk about prices in general. The regions in which people uh, migrated have seen increased economic activity, and you measure this with nightlights, you see this also with increased rents, lower vacancy uh, for housing, uh, higher consumption, and so on and so forth. So understanding this at the regional level is important and it, it goes beyond just uh, economic conflict, you know, as, as we see more and more uh, damages caused by rains and floods and so on and so forth. This, I think, has applicability later on also in terms of these aspects. Yes, you have used nightlight data, but how reliable can this be during a, a conflict? There's many reasons why there would be increased amounts of light or, or a lot less light at night. Uh, does this confuse the numbers? That's very true. And I think this is one of the reasons why nightlights in this particular context can give a slightly deceiving uh, uh, message. So, for example, large cities have had policies of uh, light masking. So people were instructed uh, to uh, to cover their uh, windows or to keep lights off, uh, even though you might have then economic activity during the day, it, there's almost nothing measured during the night or alternatively certain areas were lit to give a false impression to, to the enemy. So I think in this respect, uh, nights were actually used as an instrument, so they're not really completely uh, uh, linked to what was there prior to the war. I, I see also that uh, you've used Google searches as another method. How, in theory, would Google search capture economic activity? So in principle, we understand this as uh, the, the preliminary towards consumption, investment, uh, purchase of an automobile, purchase of a, a flight ticket, and so on and so forth. Uh, we haven't dug into the exact association to GDP components, uh, but the 70 plus categories that we're working with are very good in tracking general economic activity as measured by regional uh, GDP. So we can basically understand them as intention to purchase or intention to travel or 
so on and so forth. Uh, and in a normal setting, these intentions tend to be fairly well linked to subsequent action. And I think this is where the, the true value lies uh, in this. Um, of course, then, um, you know, there's a question related to flows of population because Google Trends, it, it, um, it's a relative number to number of searches. Uh, if the, you, if you have, for example, uh, migration, internal migration due to war, you have a lot of people living, uh, within this framework, you have a lot of people looking for a car, right? So all of a sudden, this, this is shown to be, uh, extremely, extremely strong, strongly increasing. In normal times, this is associated with a good thing. In our case, uh, this is not a good thing, right? So this, what we would call time varying correlation, depending on the nature of the shock, is one of the pitfalls uh, the, of, of using this data simply uh, as such in a regression analysis. So we always have to be uh, paying a lot of attention to how we interpret these numbers. Yes, uh, and the final method I see you're using is uh, Twitter posts. Um, and uh, they also can capture economic activity. Are they more robust to the sort of environment that you have at the moment? Yeah, in a sense, the one thing that's robust about using Twitter is the fact that it accounts for population movements. Um, um, again, if we have more or less, you know, the assumption is that the people who tweet uh, tend to be having the same behavior. Uh, if you have a certain number leaving, but the rest uh, keep their tweeting, let's say, habits, uh, then th these shares remain more or less constant, uh, constant over time. So this is what we're sort of uh, uh, focusing on. In a sense, population, large population displacements are a little bit better captured because we're measuring the number of tweets at the regional level. And the reason we use tweets is because tweets are, uh, like a lot of social media, a bit linked to conspicuous consumption. We don't analyze the pictures and the text. This is going to be a next step that, that we're thinking about because, of course, you can check what's inside of the picture associated with Twitter uh, or to check the label of the text. Is it negative? Is it positive? And so on and so forth. So now we're doing a very, very uh, simple analysis, just looking at the, the share of tweets. And we find very strong correlation between the share of tweets in a particular region to the share of GDP of that region uh, as compared to, to, to national GDP. Put this all together for me, Bigner. Um, what sort of results is this given for the given for the change in Ukrainian GDP? So the the preliminary numbers that we have are are uh, um, telling us that the March uh, decrease was somewhere between minus thirty four uh, minus thirty five to minus forty five percent compared uh, to the previous one. So this was a dramatic contraction. Uh, this was driven uh, a lot by um, uh, the siege of Kyiv. Kyiv is a, a large economic center uh, in Ukraine with almost 20... Kyiv and the region uh, goes to almost 25% of total GDP in, in Ukraine. Uh, as the battle subsided and uh, uh, things sort of normalized, uh, April and May, uh, we are seeing the same annualized decrease going somewhere between 15 and 20% decrease. So these are, you know, they're good news in a bad environment, but we're trying to 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 look at the positive side uh, to it. We're now tracking to to understand a little bit how things evolve uh, at the monthly level, and things are starting to normalize with people coming back. Uh, but in any case, the the impact March April has been quite severe. Is this experimental at the moment, or is this already being used to make policy decisions? If so, what decisions? Yeah. So um. Just as a clarification, some of this data was already being used in a national setting. So, you know, our, our, uh, readers and, and listeners will know that if, if you're in this field, there's a lot of effort, uh, of, of using this data in national now casting exercises. What we're doing, we're opening this up at the regional level. So we're trying to figure out how to use that data, uh, with a regional flavor. Um, so that data was used. Now it's being built into the regular practice because a lot of the conflict is localized. A lot of the issues that we're facing uh, in the South, for example, with potential loss of ports and so on and so forth, has repercussions on many industries like agriculture and cost of imports and so on and so forth. So I think this is getting slowly into the into the normal practice of the policy units and uh, is going to be remain is going to remain there in the future. Well, thank you for talking to me about it today. Now, we wish you all the best and uh, hope we'll be speaking again soon. Many thanks. Absolutely. Thanks for the opportunity. 
Meekner and his co-authors are publishing a paper about this, but meanwhile you can read all about it in an article on FoxEU. It's called Estimating the Short-Term Impact of War on Economic Activity in Ukraine, and it was published on the 21st of June 2022. Well, that's all for now. We'll see you soon.